the account that we've just read in Genesis chapter 1 shows that the teaching of the Bible is that God created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them in six days. And for centuries that was the accepted view. That Genesis is a literal, factual account of what happened. Now, that understanding is not, indeed cannot be taught in our schools and universities. Because the academic world, in this Western society in which we live, believes that the world is very old and that life evolved over a very long period of time. Now, the purpose of this talk tonight is not to discuss the conflicting issues of creation and evolution. It's to address the claim that we can accept the findings of science and the Bible. That by viewing certain Bible passages in a non-literal way, we can have both. So this argument says we don't have to disagree with the findings of science or reject the Bible. And what I want to show tonight is that that position is untenable. It just simply doesn't work at all. We have to make a choice between man's view of things and God's view. So, we've read Genesis 1. It is clearly a record of six days in which God created all things. And they've got to be six literal days, not long periods of time. We read in verse 3 that God said, let there be light, and there was light. And yet, at that stage, there's no sun, moon, and stars. Incidentally, if you look at the latest NASA model, of how the universe developed after the Big Bang, they have light before the stars. Um, verse 11 we read, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit, after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So God created mature plants and trees, the trees bearing fruit already. Verse 21, and God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So all the individual kinds of aquatic creatures and birds were created by God. Verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and the cattle, and over every creeping thing. Man is a separate, unique, and distinct creation, not related to any of the creatures that God had created before. Chapter 2, verse 5, says that there was not a man to till the ground. There was nothing else like the man before he was created. Verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. There was nothing in creation with which man could have a relationship. Chapter 1, verse 31 says that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. We read in chapter 2 and verse 5 that at that time there was no rain. In verse 25 of chapter 2, that the man and the woman whom God had created were both naked, and they were not ashamed. It was a very different world. In chapter 3 and verse 1, there was a serpent who was able to speak, who was more subtle than any other beast of the field. The world that God created was not like the world in which we live today. And science never knew that world and couldn't experiment upon it or draw conclusions on it because it wasn't there. In chapter 3, verse 17 onwards, we read of some significant changes that took place as a result of Adam breaking God's commandment. 
3 verse 17. Unto Adam God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So there were significant changes, including death, as a result of Adam's sin. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 20, we read that Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Notice that, we shall refer to that verse later on when we get into the New Testament. So there's a very brief summary of what we read in Genesis 1 to 3 and what it teaches when we read it literally. Now the question that we want to seek to answer now in the rest of the talk is how does the rest of the Bible comment upon and quote from these three chapters in Genesis? Do the writers of the later books of the Bible bearing in mind that ultimately God is the author of all of it do they take Genesis literally or not? So we're just going to work our way through the, the main sections of the Bible. Starting with the law. Let's turn to the book of Exodus and chapter 20. And in chapter 20 of Exodus we have the Ten Commandments which the angel bearing the name of Yahweh, the name of God, spoke from the Mount Sinai. And we read in Exodus chapter 20. These words at verse 11. Go back in the context of verse 9. <coughs> Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy stranger which is in, within thy gate. For, and here's the reason, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. <coughs> that directly confirms Genesis chapter 1. And that's the angel of God bearing the name of God, speaking from Mount Sinai. It's been suggested that because verse 11 is in the third person, that it's an interpolation. But so is verse 7. And what we've actually got here is, is the words of the angel. So we read in verse 1, And God, that is Elohim, which is a word which is used of the angels, spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So the angel is God's mouthpiece. He's speaking God's words. But he's also commenting on what God has said. For in six days the Lord, Yahweh, made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Let's turn now to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 4. And God has given all this law to the nation of Israel. And this is what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So we can't accept the Bible as the word of God and, and change its record and say, well, it doesn't mean what it says it means. Let's move on now to the book of Psalms. Psalm 33. And here's one of many psalms that speaks about the work of creation. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. 
So the magnificence and the wonder of creation, which we can see around us, is the reason why we should fear God and honour Him. Psalm 94 now and verse 8. Psalm 94, verse 8. Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? The Bible is telling us that these amazing organs which we, we have in our heads were formed by God. They didn't develop over a long period of time. I, I've seen a chart which suggests how from a light sensitive patch of skin an eye might develop in about 35,000 different discrete changes. You know, no evidence for it, it's just man's speculation of how it might happen. But the Bible says he formed the eye. It's the work of God. And even more detail in Psalm 139 where David speaks about the time of his birth. Psalm 139, verse 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written. The margin says, what days they should be fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God knows every detail of the development of the child in the womb. Because in, in, in modern speak, he wrote the programme for the whole process, <laughs> from fertilisation to birth. Let's move on to the prophets now, the book of Isaiah and chapter 42. And we're just picking out a very small number of references. There are many, many more in this vein. Isaiah 42, verse 5. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. And we might add to that um, the words of Elihu in the book of Job. If he set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again to the dust. So the very fact we are alive is by the grace and the power of God. He's energising our bodies. He made all things, and we continue to live by his power and according to his will. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 45. And verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So both the, the physical things of this world and the moral standards are all of God. Verse 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So you see there is a purpose to creation. God had an intention when he made all these things. And that's brought out for us in verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. God has created, God has a purpose. He will save, all will bow to him. If you can find the little prophecy of Amos, so Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. There's an interesting detail in Amos chapter 4. 
Amos chapter 4, and God is appealing to the people of Israel to turn from idols, from gods that men had made, to serve and worship him. Amos 4 verse 6, I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So he's caused famine. Has he done that? Verse 7. And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to the harvest. And I caused it to rain upon one city and caused it not to rain upon another city. One place was rained upon and the place whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered and the word means they staggered because they were dehydrated wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Now, man talks about a hydrological cycle, and indeed so does the Bible. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full, says the wise man in the book of Ecclesiastes. And to the place where the rivers began, thither the waters return again. And we know that there is this cycle of evaporation and cloud formation, and rain and rivers flowing into the sea. But what these verses in Amos are telling us is that God is in close control of all this. He can cause it to rain upon one city and not upon another, that he might work out his purpose. And we shall see that mentioned again in the New Testament. So let's move on now to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to turn to the Gospel record through Matthew and chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus was, was teaching the multitudes and healing. And we read in verse 3 that the Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, and said unto them, unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? They, they wanted to know, what, what are the grounds for divorce, if there are any? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? And he's going to quote from the book of Genesis. And he's saying to them, If you've read Genesis and understood it, you wouldn't be asking me this question. Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning, and that's a quotation from Genesis 1 verse 1, made them male and female, that's a quotation from Genesis 1 verse 27, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And that's a quotation from Genesis 2 and verse 24. And that shows three things. First of all, that Jesus read Genesis literally. And to him, the beginning included the creation of man. The second thing is that Jesus saw no conflict at all between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. He quotes both chapters in one saying. And thirdly, his moral teaching about the relationship of man and woman and the permanence of marriage is based on the facts of creation. God made one man and one woman. And there's no room in that for triangles or same-sex relationships or anything else. But one man and one woman joined in marriage by God. That they might be together. A man should not interfere with that, says Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul learned his gospel directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I, I wasn't taught it by man. And he was sent out to preach to the Gentiles. And we're going to have a look in the book of Acts now and see just what Paul did preach to the Gentiles. And we'll start in Acts chapter 14. See, when the Apostle Paul preached to the Jews, he opened their scriptures, the Old Testament, uh, and he reasoned with them out of the scriptures that the Jesus who he preached was the Messiah that they were looking for. Now the Gentiles just didn't have that sort of background and understanding. So when the Apostle Paul preached to Gentiles, he approached the matter very differently. And this was the gospel that he'd learned from the Lord Jesus Christ. So Acts chapter 14, and we'll go in at verse 12, because Paul and Barnabas have just healed a crippled man. And local people are amazed and think they are gods. So verse 12 of Acts 14, they call Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. They thought they were Mercury and Jupiter. 
Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God. That's what God was saying through Amos. Turn from idols and serve me. But he's the living God, verse 15, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So notice the details. God made all things in heaven and earth. That's Genesis 1 language. Rain and fruitful seasons are gifts from God. Remember what we read in Amos chapter 4. God can make it rain on this city and withhold the rain from that city. God's in daily control. Weather conditions are not the result of a natural cycle. They're God's blessings, or in some cases God's weapons. Let's move on now to another example of Paul preaching to Gentiles in Acts chapter 17. Paul is then at Athens. He's among the best intellects of Greek society. And he preaches to them. Verse 22 of Acts 17. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions... I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. So Paul found that the city was, as it says, wholly given to idolatry there in verse 16. There were idols, temples and altars all over Athens. And he found one altar which was inscribed to the unknown God, which the Athenians had put there just in case there was a God they didn't know about. And Paul said, yes, there is. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, verse 23, him declare I unto you. Who is this God? God that made the world and all things therein. He's Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He's not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And that's what we saw, isn't it, in the prophecy of Isaiah. Man's breath is in the hand of God. And, verse 26, hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Remember what we read in Genesis chapter 3? Eve is the mother of all living. They've all come from one source. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. So the distribution of the races throughout the earth is all of God. His determination, who should live where. Why did he do this? What's the reason for it? Verse 27. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. You see, the Greek philosopher Epicurus, with whose followers... Paul had been contending back in verse 18 of this chapter. The Greek philosopher Epicurus taught that the gods were remote and indifferent to men. Oh, they're, they're in heaven somewhere, they're not bothered about what goes on on the earth. Paul says, no, this God in whom I preach is, is near to us. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So, verse 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, he has made us, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like to gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Man hasn't made God, it's the other way around. God has made man, says Paul. And the times of this ignorance, verse 30, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And he has the authority to do that, because he's the creator. And, verse 31, 
He hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has been called the best attested fact in history. It can be demonstrated that there was indeed a dead body put into a tomb and that three days later that tomb was empty. The authorities could not produce the body because Jesus had risen from the dead. And that's God's assurance to us that he is carrying out his purpose, that he will judge the world. So the Apostle Paul is teaching the things that we read in the Old Testament. His gospel to the Gentiles flows from a Genesis creation to the kingdom of God. Let's move on now to his letters. After Acts comes the letters to the Romans and we're going to have a look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. <clears throat> Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's the language of Genesis chapter 3. Because Adam broke God's commandment, then God said, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Not that it was going to happen ever anyway, but because thou hast done this, thou shalt return unto the dust. And not just Adam, but death passed upon all men. For Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 says that Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. Not now in the image of God as Adam had been made, but one like Adam, a fallen dying creature and this verse is a major problem to those who try to say you can have both the Bible and science because evolution needs death to work the survival of the fittest and yet the Bible says death came into the world as a result of Adam's disobedience and Romans chapter 5 verse 12 is the beginning of an argument which runs down to the end of the chapter which contrasts the disobedience of Adam that brought death and the obedience of Jesus which has opened the way to life. So just verse 19 for example. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. You take out the Adam brought death bit and, and the equation just doesn't work. And the life and death and resurrection of Jesus just simply becomes an example. It, it's not a sacrifice for sin and a means of re reconciliation to God at all. Go on a couple more books. 2 Corinthians and chapter 11. And here's another reference back to the Garden of Eden. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. The apostle writing to the believers in Corinth says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And there's a pattern for that in Genesis chapter, chapter 2. Because God created Adam first, and then created Eve, and brought her to Adam. And God joined them together. Eve was presented to Adam. And the apostle says that the, the, the congregation, the whole congregation of believers is in effect the bride of Christ and are going to be presented to him when he comes. But, he says in verse 3, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted. And the Apostle draw, is drawing a direct parallel between what happened in Genesis chapter 3, where there was a literal serpent who deceived Eve into thinking that it was okay to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And false teachers who would come in among the believers and 
convince them that another gospel was, was better than the gospel of Paul. And again, if there was no serpent and no beguiling of Eve, where's the basis for Paul's teaching? It just collapses. His teaching on the moral issues there in Corinth is based on the literal facts of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And just one more from the writings of Paul. The first letter that he wrote to Timothy and chapter 2. Now here the Apostle Paul is teaching about the roles of the men and the women in the congregation of believers. So he says at verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And if we were looking at this in another context, we could show that the, the good works of the females are done with hands which are as holy as the hands which the men lifted up in prayer. They have two different roles. Both are holy. Both are good. But then the Apostle goes on to say in verse 11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why does he teach that? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So the moral teaching on the roles of the man and the woman in the congregation of believers is based on the facts of Genesis 2 and 3. And if that sequential creation of Adam first and then Eve, or the circumstances of the transgression as recorded in Genesis 3 didn't happen, there's no basis for the moral teaching that we have here in the New Testament. So we're going finally now to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And there's two aspects of the references back to Genesis in Revelation that we need to notice. Let's start in Revelation chapter 10. It's face like the sun, and he's going to pronounce the judgments of the seven thunders. And what does he say? Verse 5 of Revelation 10. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. So here we have an angel swearing by God as the creator of everything in heaven and earth and sea that certain things should happen. It's Genesis 1 language. It's literal Genesis 1 language. Spoken by an angel who clearly did not see Genesis 1 as picture language and not to be understood as a factual account. And what clearer authority can we have for accepting the literality of Genesis chapter 1? Now turn to chapter 14. Chapter 14 begins with a, a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ returned to the earth in Jerusalem with all the faithful of all ages gathered together around him. It's the beginning of the kingdom of God upon the earth. And then in verse 6, John sees another angel flying in the midst of heaven having what's called the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. The everlasting gospel is literally in the Greek, the gospel of the age. Because there's a new age beginning in the earth, the age of the kingdom of God. And there is good news to be proclaimed to every nation and kindred and tongue in the world. God is going to, once the Lord Jesus Christ is, is set up in Jerusalem, He's going to give every, everybody in the earth the opportunity to hear his good news and to respond to it. 
verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. That's very much like what Paul said in Acts 17, isn't it? You know, that God is to be feared. He's made, he's made everything. And he's going to judge the world. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So the gospel, the good news that's going to be preached to the inhabitants of the earth once the Lord Jesus Christ has returned and been established as king in Jerusalem begins with creation. It's Genesis 1 language. And this gospel is going to be preached to a world, at least this western part of it, which has banned the teaching of creation from its schools and which largely rejects God's existence. And the message is, believe these things because God is about to judge you. That's the first thing we want to notice about Revelation. That it refers back to Genesis chapter 1 in a very dramatic way. Now here's the second thing. We're going to go to the last chapters of the Bible now. <clears throat> Revelation 21 and 22. And if you read through these last two chapters of the Bible carefully you will keep seeing in them the language of the early chapters of Genesis. So, Revelation 21, verse 1. And I saw new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. That, that contains echoes of days 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. Um, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And in verse 4 of, Genesis, of Revelation 21, God is reversing what happened in Genesis chapter 3. When death and sorrow were brought in as a result of man's sin. Uh, chapter 21 and verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Again, that echoes day one of creation, when God said, let there be light, and there was no sun, moon, and stars. Chapter 22 and verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's Garden of Eden language. Garden of Eden with the tree of life there in the midst of it. And that river flowing out of the garden which divided into four great rivers and watered the earth. Revelation 22 and verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. That, that reverses Genesis chapter 3. When God cursed the earth for man's sake. And finally, Genesis 22 and verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. And that's a marvellous contrast to Genesis chapter 3, where we have a man who did not do God's commandment. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast not done that which I command. There's a man who is disobedient. And because of that he is thrust out of the garden and he is not allowed to eat of the tree of life. Here we have men and women who are obedient to the commandments of God. And they have right to enter in, into the city, and to eat of the tree of life. And what all this is saying in these last two chapters of the Bible is that God will accomplish his purpose which was all in his mind before he began the work of creation that's narrated in Genesis chapter 1. He knew the end from the beginning. And the sin of man did not cause a problem to that purpose. Because it was foreseen and the Saviour was known by God. What all this is saying is God is going to remove the death and the curse which he brought in in Genesis 3. He's going to dwell with man. He's going to bring blessings to the earth. It's the message of the whole of the Bible, in fact. 
from Genesis to Revelation. But what we've seen tonight is that as we've worked our way through the Bible, there are constant references back to the Genesis account of creation. It's the basis, it's the foundation of all of God's dealings with men. And if we discard it, or if we spiritualise it, if we do anything but read it literally, the rest of Scripture loses its meaning. And the hope that's offered in its pages ceases to be real.